Well, this Advent season, we're going to be looking at this um, wonderful, wonderful poem found in Luke, Luke chapter 1. A poem, a, a song, a, a song given by Mary, a song given by Mary. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 1, and we're going to begin our series today in verses 26 through 38, 26 through 38. We're going to set some background on this wonderful, marvelous story. Um, we'll be looking at the Song of Mary, this poem uh, that Luke recorded for us from multiple perspectives so that uh, our hearts too might, like Mary's, rejoice at the good things that God has done at this time of year. When we talk about this, uh, this song, this poem, and isn't it interesting that God chose to use the poem written by a teenager, by a teenager, to describe such remarkable things to us. In fact, one um, writer of uh, history says that from his perspective, Mary's song is one of the most revolutionary songs that have ever been written. If you think there were songs written in the 1960s that were revolutionary, well, this song, many believe, is a revolutionary song or a revolutionary poem. Because if you look in there, you'll see that it almost creates a moral revolution because Mary talks about the fact in this song that God has humbled the proud. He changes their interior about who they think they are and what they can do. Some see it as a social revolution as well, a, a social revolution, because God sort of equalizes the playing field. He takes those who are in certain positions, the poor and the rich, and he equalizes them in this song. And some people see it as a social revolution. Other people see it as an economic revolution, because it seems like he cares for the poor, that he's one who looks after the poor. That he's one who distributes to the poor. He's one who cares for the poor. Now, I'm not sure that that's what Mary had in mind. Probably not. She probably didn't write this as a revolutionary um, poem. But if you really look at it, it can have a revolutionary effect on how we see things. And if we really study it and read it, it can have a revolutionary effect on us as well. On us as well. Um, this was quite to say the least, a remarkable song or a poem. And let's keep in mind that God uses a teenager to write this beautiful, poetic song. I want us to uh, begin by looking at this song, by looking in, at the background of it. So if you have your Bible, turn to verses 26 through 38 of Luke chapter 1. Let's read this together as we prepare ourselves for Mary's song over the next several weeks. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee <clears throat> to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high God. The Lord will give you his throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never, never end. How will this be, Mary asks, the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. The angel left her. I want to start looking at this passage by uh, quoting a character in a film. 
And the character is found in the movie Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. The character in the movie is, um, is Sergeant Dan. Remember? Sergeant Dan. Played by Gary Sinise. There's a scene in that film where Forrest has gone out. He's purchased a shrimping boat. He's decided that he's going to be a shrimping captain. He finds Lieutenant Dan. Remember, he's on the, sitting on the pier in a wheelchair. Forrest picks up Lieutenant Dan and asks him to join him in his endeavor to be a, a shrimping boat captain. And there's a scene in there where um, Forrest throws out the nets and he brings them all in. And you might have remembered this scene. He pulls it all in and he opens up the net hoping for a great great hoard of shrimp. And all that, all that drops out of that net is an army helmet, a license plate, a bunch of trash, a shoe, and other items. Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Dan brings himself down off of the uh, crow's nest that he was sitting on, and he says to Forrest Gump, where's this God of yours now? Where's this God of yours now? And if you remember what Forrest says, it's funny that Lieutenant Dan asked that question, remember? Because God showed up in a big way. And it turned out that there was this huge thunderstorm and a huge raging storm. And remember, all the boats get um, ransacked and destroyed but forests. And it turns out that he ends up catching more shrimp than any other boat ever has caught. I think that statement of Lieutenant Dan is probably the statement that the people of Israel had in their minds at this particular time. Where is this God of yours now? It may have been on the lips of some of the children who are asking their parents. Where's this God of yours now? Where is he? I mean, it's been over 400 years since the closing of the book of Malachi and the opening of this particular story, 400 years. 400 years between when Malachi ended and Gabriel suddenly goes like this on the door of Mary. 400 years. Maybe grandchildren were asking their grandparents, you know, you've told us all this story. Where is your God now? Where is he? As we'll see in just a minute here, this was not the best of times. This was not the easiest time for people to be alive. Where is your God now? Where is your God now? There had been a realignment of the powers, a realignment of the powers. Egypt was beginning to fade. This once and glorious kingdom called Egypt was starting to fade. Um, Greece was starting to lose a bit of its glory as well. A Rome was on the rise at this particular time. They had taken over, and they were the country to be reckoned with. And Israel, this glorious place, this wonderful place that we read about in the chapters of the Old Testament, Israel now was not an independent nation. They were a puppet nation in many ways underneath the rule and the reign of Rome. The glory of Israel had passed. And so much of what was Israel's at that particular time had uh, kind of been put away. And Israel was no longer a, a group of people that people were saying, oh, this is it. What a wonderful thing. No, there were people there who might have been saying the same thing that those kids would have said. Where is this God now? How could it be this way? How could it be this particular way? Where is this God of yours now? 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 9 says this, The Lord isn't slow concerning His promises, as some people count slowness. But I'll tell you, people back here probably were thinking, He's pretty slow. <laughs> He's pretty slow. I mean, 400 years? I want you to think about that. 400 years. The glory of Israel just seemed to have faded away and it wasn't what it used to be. And people were longing and waiting and longing and waiting. In fact, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia describes it this way. The return from Babylon marked a turning point in the spiritual history of the Jews. From the time, this time onward, the lust of idolatry which had marked their whole previous history utterly disappeared. In, the place it, it, uh, in place of it, 
came an almost intolerable spirit of exclusiveness, a striving after legal holiness. These two in combination forming the very heart and core of later Phariseeism. The holy books, but especially the law, became an object of almost idolatrous reverence. The spirit was utterly lost in the form. And as their own tongue, the classic Hebrew, gradually gave way to the common Aramaic to keep the ancient tongues pure, worship and life, each demanding a separate language. Thus, Jews became a sense bilingual. The Hebrew tongue being used in their synagogues, the Aramaic in their daily life, and later on, in at least part, the Greek tongue of the conqueror, the lingua franca of the period. A spiritual aristocracy very largely replaced the former rule of their princes and nobles. As the core of their religion died, the bark of the tree flourished. Ties were zealously collected by the Jews. The Sabbath became a burden of sanctity. The simple laws of God were replaced by cumbersome human inventions, which in last t- later times were to form the bulk of what the Jews were to follow, and it would crush down any liberty until the days of Christ. That's what this comes into. That's why the knock on the door here is so revolutionary. That's why when Gabriel comes, he changes and begins to change everything. And people were saying very much so, where is your God now? Where is he now? What I always find interesting about this story, and I hope you read it with new fresh eyes, is that God does something really simple to get the story started. If you read Luke chapter 1, what you discover is he gets the story started through the casting of dice or lot. If you look at Luke chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Gabriel shows up first and lets um, Zechariah know of the good news of the birth of the Savior and of John the Baptist who would pave the way by casting a lot. Have you ever read that and thought about that? He gets him into the temple to be a priest by casting a lot. He doesn't come to him and say, behold, you are going in to be a priest. He does the normal everyday thing. They throw the dice, they cast a lot. It falls on Zechariah and suddenly he goes in and there's where it all starts. It starts with a simple casting of the lot. God doesn't do anything spectacular here necessarily. Just a very simple procedure which reminds us that Again, that sometimes in the very small things, God is at work. In the very small things, God is often at work. So Gabriel steps in right there. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at this section of verses here and get some understanding of how they relate to us and how, um, how this Christmas can be meaningful to us as we look at Mary's song. Because these are the preparations to Mary writing that given song. And I want us to look at it from a very practical level. I want us to remember something, that God can do anything in any place at any time with anybody. (laughs) God can do anything in any place at any time with anybody. And I want us to look at that because that's one of the great encouragements and comforts of Christmas. That God can do anything at any time, in any place, with anybody. And I'd like to see how that kind of works its way out as we prepare our hearts for the weeks ahead and the Advent season ahead as we begin to look at this wonderful song. Uh, We've titled the series, Have a Merry Christmas. Have a Merry Christmas. We're going to look at this wonderful song of Mary. But before we do that, let's look at a few points. Number one is this. Number one is this. Anything God has ever done, anywhere, he can do here. God is not limited to place. God's not limited to place. In fact, if you look at this story, where does um, Gabriel the angel go? To Nazareth. To Nazareth. Goes to Nazareth. Nazareth was not exactly like going to the city of Portland. (laughs) Nazareth was not a place that uh, necessarily people always wanted to talk about. In fact, if you go to John chapter uh, uh, 1, verse 46, you will find that when um, Philip discovers Jesus, he runs to Nathanael, his brother, right? And he says something to him. 
Come here, we finally found the one Moses had been talking about. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And do you remember what Nathaniel's statement was? What? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, we kind of blow over that statement, but Nathaniel is right. Nazareth was not a place that you would necessarily go to. It was sort of a hidden place. It was a, a hilly place. It was sort of pressed in to the hillside. It was a place where people would go to hide. It was a place where sometimes what we might call the riffraff or the people in the margins would go. There are some theologians who believe that when um, <clears throat> Joseph takes Mary to go to Bethlehem for the tax, that he does that because Mary's not safe. Because Joseph could have gone by himself. He didn't need to bring Mary with him to pay his taxes. And he, many believe, perhaps, that maybe Mary was not safe in her own hometown. That there may have been some real problems leaving a pregnant, supposedly virgin in Nazareth. And Joseph knew it. Now, granted, yes, there's a lot more to the story. And we believe in the supernatural leading of God's Holy Spirit through the whole thing. But from a human level, perhaps Joseph said, I can't leave my wife alone in Nazareth. It isn't exactly the kind of place I want to leave my fiance. So I'm taking her with me. That's how rough Nazareth was. But Gabriel shows up there. And the, star, and the story shows up right there. And it begins right there. And I want to encourage you to remember that no matter where you are, no matter where you live, no matter what circumstances, no matter where you are, this particular Christmas, no matter where we go, God can do something there. God can do something there. Think about that. I want to encourage you to be hypersensitive this season to wherever you go. Because listen, God is not limited to a place. He's not limited to a place. God just doesn't show up here in the church on Sundays. God is all over. He's in that store you're shopping in. He's in that mall. He's all over. He's not limited to time and place. Because God is a God who um, can do anything at any given time. And I want to encourage you to be alert to the nudges that come around. That's when I read this about Nazareth. It reminds me, God goes everywhere. Everywhere. And so I want to encourage you to go out from this place today and think about where God might show up. Yeah, he could show up there as you're getting a piece of pizza at Costco. He can show up, you know, as you're going to the mall. He can show up when you're, you're just outside and suddenly your neighbor might come over. God might be knocking on doors all over the place. And remember, God is not limited to places. Nothing stops him. And that's what I learn and that's what I see here. God jumps right into history, but wow, does he jump into unique places and use unique people. So be sensitive Beloved family, be sensitive to the people around you. God just might open up a door for you this holiday in the most unique and interesting places. But let, let, let's continue on. Let's look at something else. Whatever God does, anything God has done, he can do now. God is not limited by time. God is not limited by time. We've often talked about this because this is always a great verse, Galatians chapter 4, 4 to 5, where it says what? At just the right time or in the fullness of time, right? God came to earth. He sent his son as a sacrifice at just the right time. People are always thinking about that at just the right time. And we've said here in, in the introduction that you know, Israel was a minor player in this particular world, a minor player. <clears throat> they had been pushed aside. Rome, Rome was overtaxing people. People were overburdened with taxes. If you think we pay taxes, they pay taxes. Rome was a taxation culture. And it was a dictatorship, by the way. A very, very difficult place. Although it was a republic, Caesar was still revered, and it really was in many ways a dictatorship based upon Caesar's wishes. 
a tough place to really, really live. Greece. Greece is full of idols, and we've talked about this before, but it was quite a pluralistic culture. Polytheism was rampant all over Greece. It was there. It was on every corner, on every place. Things were sold in the market. Idols were given in the market. There was an idol for every given thing. Guess what? That made the hearts of the people just ache to know the truth. Made their hearts just ache to know the truth. Who is the right God? And who is the one that we should be worshiping? And where should we go? And the Jews had come up with such incredible amounts of rules and regulations that when Jesus says in Matthew chapter eleven twenty eight, when he says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what he's really talking about there? He's talking about a religion that killed people's spirit. Come to me, you're weary. You've tried every way possible to please God, every way possible to live this life every way possible to know the answer to the question, how does one find God? And you are just weary of it. And people were. But he says, come to me. Notice what he says. Notice Jesus' words. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isn't that interesting? God says, my yoke is easy. My burdens are light. God is not one to weigh people down with rules and regulations. God is one who wants people to experience abundant life and the freedom that comes in knowing Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus says. If you're burdened down by religion, if you've tried your best to try to get to God and the answer just doesn't seem to be there for you and you still have this guilt that weighs you down and you still don't know what to do with your life because you want so much to do the right thing, but you can't, then guess what? Come to me. I'll take all that burden off you because my yoke is easy. <clears throat> my burden is very, very light. This was the way people were ready. They were prepared <clears throat> for the given moment for Christ to come. Oh, and Rome had built, what? Numerous roads, right? They had roads all over the place so the gospel could spread. The Greek language was out there so that the gospel could go out into the world. And in establishments all over places, you'll notice when Paul goes on his missionary journeys, where does he go? To the synagogue. There were teaching places right there, and Paul would often go to those places first. God had established the synagogues. So listen, amidst all that, even amidst our country now, God is establishing. Think about the internet. Think about Twitter. Think about Instagram. Think about these places. God is not limited. He can even use the internet highway. He can use technology. He can use satellites to communicate his word. Be ready for those things. God is always at work. I, <clears throat> I saw this yesterday. I want to share this quickly. I watched two sporting events yesterday. I watched the Alabama game. Okay. Any of you see that game? Alabama, right? They beat Georgia. And uh, you remember that the starting quarterback for Alabama got hurt, and Jalen Hurts steps in. Jalen Hurts was their previous starting quarterback, but when the new quarterback came, they benched Jalen and put him in second spot. And after the game, because Jalen Hurts had orchestrated this phenomenal comeback for Alabama, the commentator comes up to him and, and says to him, well, you got your opportunity, Jalen. What do you think about this opportunity? You know, you've kind of been sitting back, and now all of a sudden you got this great opportunity to go down and to be the hero again. What do you think? He says, God orchestrated it all. God did it. God is the one who put it together. I don't have much more to say. God was the one who gave me this opportunity. The commentator turns away and goes to Nick Saban at that point because there's nothing more to comment. <laughs> Jalen Hurts was as clear as possible. Don't think that God can't work in the most unusual places and with the most unusual times, right? Right? 
Last night, a friend of mine said, hey, I'm, I'm buying the pay-per-view big fight. There was a fight up there between um, one of the fighters' names was um, Tyson Fury, okay, and Devin uh, Wilder. This was a heavyweight championship fight to unite the belts together. And Tyson Fury, just, you know, when he first got out there, boy, my friend and I both said, this is, a, this is just a strange fighter. This is a strange fighter. And for 12 whole rounds, these guys fought each other. Heavyweights. I mean heavyweights. In fact, uh, Wilder knocked Tyson Fury down on his back in the 12th round. And everybody thought it's over now. And Tyson Fury suddenly shakes it off and gets up and still fights. Well, at the end of the fight, we're waiting for the decision and it was a draw. A draw. So... They get the two fighters together, and they ask Tyson Fury, well, what did you think of the fight? What did you think? He goes, I just want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ, who's my Savior, <laughs> for giving me the opportunity to fight this wonderful man in the ring. I love this guy. <laughs> I think he's one of the greatest fighters ever. In fact, both of us are number one and number two fighters in the world, and I love him, and I love you, and I love the fans. <laughs> You know, and I'm standing there going, oh, brother, you know. But I just want to thank Jesus for letting me pummel this guy to death this today, you know. <laughs> Sounds a little off, doesn't it, you know. I kind of want to go out there and beat my brother to pieces. I don't know. It just sounds a little off. But what's my point? God can work what? Anywhere, right? He's not limited by the crowd. He's not limited by certain events. I mean, I sat there and I turned to my friend Randy and went, so what do you think about that? There's the gospel given right there in some short way. I want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ for saving me and giving me the privilege of fighting. Wow, right there. I just said to my friend, Merry Christmas. <laughs> there it is. There's the Christmas message right there. And that's what we see right here. God is not limited. He's not limited by places or times. And let's look at the final point. Anything that God has ever done for anyone, he can do for you. I mean, the story of Christmas is a story about God surprising us with the people that he uses. I wish we could go through the whole story and look at all the characters of Christmas, but you think about the people that God selects during this Christmas season. Shepherds in the field, Mary and Joseph, a priest and Elizabeth. Some pagan astronomers who are looking at a star. God chooses those people. And whatever he's done for them, he can do for you. Don't ever think that because of who you are, God can't use you. Or God can't change your circumstances. He does just that. In fact, look at um, verse 28 here. I mean, Mary is, is the angel uh, went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary didn't feel highly favored, I'm sure. She was a teenager. She didn't feel like she was part of the highly favored group, but when God gets a hold of her, she is. She is highly favored. And anything that God has done for anyone, he can do for you. You think of John the Baptist. When someone talked about John the Baptist, Jesus says, you know, no man has ever been born who is greater than John the Baptist, but I'll tell you right now, the lowest person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. In other words, no matter who you are, God can use you in very, very special ways. Because why? Let's look at these verses. Look at verse 37. For nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. So it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. You know, God can use you. The key here and the challenge here for all of us in the midst of all this is found in the final verse, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And I hope that this Christmas you'll have that spirit. Lord, this Christmas, however you want to use me, whenever you want to use me, however you want to use me, be it unto you. I'm your servant. Nothing's impossible. So no matter where I am, you're not limited. No matter what has happened, you're not limited. And the things that you've done in the past, you can do even now. 
you can do even now. Because God can do anything, at any time, in any place, with anybody. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opening of the story that Chris has talked about and challenged us to think about <clears throat> and to be captured anew and afresh again. This story of how you entered into the world as, as it's been translated into the um, message that the word came to us and moved right into our neighborhood. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the characters that you picked, Mary and Joseph. And we thank you that this story reminds us that you can do anything, in any place, with anyone, at any time. Lord, help us to keep that in mind this Christmas. May we be sensitive to your Holy Spirit's nudgings in our own life when we hear his voice or we think a thought and suddenly that thought begins to well up in us. May we think about where that thought is coming from and what that means to us. And may we not limit it to just here at Gateway, although we'll be <clears throat> caught up in the wonder of the season. Lord, let us remember that as we leave here, you are still caught up in the wonder of the season, and may we be so as well. And may we listen to the nudges that you're doing in us and in others. And perhaps make this a great Christmas for those of our neighbors and friends. Thank you for opening this story in such a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen.